Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, warning you against the upcoming issuance of the Mark of the Beast. And in this video, what we're going to do is review the scripture that identifies what a beast is. And in the process, we'll be identifying who is the man whose name has the number 666. And then we'll be looking in scripture to explain what the Mark of the Beast is, putting that all together along with our current events and understanding how this mark of the beast will be issued much sooner than you think. So go ahead and hit the like button. Make sure you watch the video to the end, leaving comments as we go and make sure that you are subscribed as we approach this critical time in human history. So then after wasting a lot of time, I decided to come back to the scripture <laughs> <laughs> try to get some hints on who this guy actually is. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we hear about him in Revelations 13. So we're going to jump down through here and pull out a few verses. Okay. That will help us to understand who this guy is. Mm -hmm. And I believe by the end of this video, everybody's going to be convinced who he actually is. Mm, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's start here at verse one and we'll look at some of these verses real quickly. Okay. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, we've already talked about this name of blasphemy here. This is how this guy has written on his forehead that he's a replacement for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. You remember, that's why they labeled the Messiah as blasphemous, because he said that he was the son of God. Right. So him being the son of God or God himself was labeled blasphemous for saying that he was the son of God, mm -hmm. which, you know, we all are actually the sons of the Most High. Right. Here you have this dude that's actually put on his hat that he is the replacement. Mm. That's kind of bold. But then notice this other part where it's talking about having seven heads and ten horns. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, we learn in the book of Daniel that a beast is talking about a government. Right. It's mm -hmm. kind of given like a scary name. People think of a wild animal. But anytime we see the word beast in the book of Revelation and, and most of the time throughout the Bible, it's simply talking about a government. Mm -hmm. But this one, this particular government is talking about the fourth beast that Daniel prophesied about saying that he has seven heads and ten horns. And we easily know these as the ten federated nations. Right. Mm hmm. The Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Alamans, the Burgundians, the Visigoths, Survey, Vandals, Heruli, Bavarians, and Ostrogoths. All you have to do is look at a chart of the timeline history of the world, and you can actually see these kingdoms come out. There you have the first beast over here with the Greeks, the next beast with the Persians, the Roman Empire was the third beast. And then you have this fourth beast that you see comes out of the Roman Empire. There's your Visigoths. There's your Bulgarians. And if you look closely here, you can find all 10 of these different groups that comes out of the Roman Empire. This is the fourth beast. Then if we'll reverse two. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. What this is talking about is how this fourth beast will have similarities to the other beasts. Mm -hmm. You see a picture from Clarence Larkin over here where it's describing the fourth beast. And he has the feet of a bear. This bear was part of the Medo-Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. He has the mouth of the lion talking about the Babylonian Empire. And he's like a leopard. He's like the Grecian Empire. Okay. And you, you can look at those and see what exactly it's talking about. Like, for instance, how the Grecian war machine, how they, you know, outfitted their armies. And, you know, it, that's the way these armies of the fourth beast are today. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's like the leopard. But he has the feet of the bear. The Persians were into conquering other nations and different stuff like that. So it's kind of like he's marching through. He has the feet. And then he has the mouth of the lion, which they was all about education and, you know, training people into the Babylonian culture and doing stuff like that. So you have all of those in this fourth beast here. Okay. 
But then notice that it says, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Right. This is the fourth beast. And, you know, how they have so much authority now is because of who they're getting their power from. Okay. And, you know, you could do research on that, how they have meetings with this guy. And anyway, look at verse three. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. This right here, what I'm understanding from my online research is that this is pointing to the fall of the Roman Empire as far as the Pope is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, back there with the um, Protestant revolt and how they pretty much uh, almost annihilated the papal system, but it recovered. Right. But we're gonna, we'll come back to that. Okay. Then look at verse four. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So what this is talking about is all of these federated nations. Mm -hmm. the, the UN, United Nations is pretty much made up of these people now. Mm -hmm. And who would dare go against the United Nations? Right. Um, that's what they're saying. Who, who, I guess I just said it, who would dare make war with the beast. All right, look at verse five. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. But what he's saying there in verse five is that this original beast was given a, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. And if we look at verse five in relationship to verse three, what this is saying is, is that this beast that John saw rising up out of the sea was in power for 42 months. Mm, okay. That's going to be one of the biggest clues that tells us who this 666 mm. guy is. Mm. But we're going to come back to that. Let's go on to verse six. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Yeah. So this right here, this beast, this this guy who was given 42 months, that's who he's talking about here, how he opened his mouth to blaspheme against God, his name and his tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's giving us hints on who, who this individual is. Right. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay. So to ruin the suspense here, it's talking about Constantine. Constantine. This, this right here. Yeah. <laughs> this, Isn't he dead? <laughs> he is dead. Okay. But like we said, we follow the truth wherever it leads. Okay. But that's what this is talking about here when it's saying, given unto him to make war with the saints. Mm, okay. And we know what he did. Well, the trickery he pulled on those uh, followers of the father. Absolutely. What we learn is that back in 312, Constantine decided that he was the head of the church. He saw some vision, he claims, that he saw a vision that told him that he was supposed to be the head of the Christian church. Mm -hmm. Whereas before he had been killing the Christians, mm -hmm. slaughtering the saints even the day before, decided in 312 that he was now the head over them. Mm -hmm. And since he outlawed the slaughtering of the saints, a lot of them banded behind him and actually allowed him to become the head of the church. Right. Okay. But we learn over here at World's Last Chance, one of the very first thing he did was outlaw the biblical calendar, did away with Passover and forced people to keep Easter instead. Mm. Okay. And so that's part of what it's talking about over here where it says he was able to make war with the saints and overcome them mm -hmm. by taking away their calendar from them. He was actually able to have power over them and he continued to actually um, kill them throughout history. He just didn't kill the ones who were supporting him and following the calendar. Anybody who actually tried to stick with the biblical calendar, he had them killed. Right. Or right. even through the Crusades and everything. Mm. Mm. Okay. So this is the guy that was talking about up here in verse 5 that was given the 42 months. Okay. So does that line up? It does line up, but I think you're getting a little bit ahead of us, so let's mm -hmm. go on here. Okay. Let's look at verse 8. 
And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So anybody whose name is not written in the book of life is worshiping this first beast now. Okay. Or at least at the time, mm -hmm. everybody whose name was not written in the book of life was worshiping the first beast, the government system. In other words, they became Catholics. Mm, they okay. start following the Catholic doctrine, even up to keeping Easter and the other holidays, holidays of the beast. Those right. are the holidays of the beast that he instituted. And those whose names are not written in the book of life are following. Even to the day, they're still following those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But anyway, let's let's go on. We're still getting a little ahead of ourselves. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Now, what this is saying, if, if, if you really want to know the truth, you listen. There's, right. there's many people who don't want to know the truth. You know, as soon as I said that 666 wasn't Donald Trump, a lot of people clicked off the video. Right. You know, they go go find somebody else that's going to tell them what they want to hear. Or Obama. Obama, whoever right. it is, <laughs> whoever Joe Biden, want. whatever it is, they're going to find somebody mm -hmm. that's going to go along with what they want to hear. And so that's what this was referring to. If you want to know the truth, you need to listen very carefully mm -hmm. because it tells us exactly who this 666 guy is. Mm. And we just got to want to know the truth. It's not who this guy is up here. Because we ain't got to him yet. Look down here in verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Yeah, revenge is real. That's what this is talking about. He who who persecuted the church, the ones under Constantine that did all of this harm in the past. These are the same people now that's going to catch the brunt force of this apocalypse. Mm. You know, that's why I say you better pay attention. That's why in other parts of the book, it says you better separate yourself or you're going to get caught up in the same plagues that these guys are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in a time of repentance. We need to get on it. But anyway, look at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. So here's another beast. This is the second one. This is the second one that, that we're talking about him. He's a part of the fourth beast overall but he's another one that's coming out of the the first beast that we're talking about mm -hmm. because if you remember up here it says that this beast up here was only given 42 months right back up here in verse five mm -hmm. so after these 42 months are over that this first guy was given now down here in verse 11 you got another beast that's coming after this guy so this uh second beast is coming after Constantine, but coming out of his teachings? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, look at verse 12. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Yeah, so this, this second guy is actually pushing everybody to worship the first beast. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, Jake basically is drawing your attention to him. Mm-hmm. Look at verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So this guy, this second individual is doing all of this. Yeah. But then notice right here that it's actually starting to get into this 666 part. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Read verse 17. We're going to start breaking down who this guy is. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So this is the second beast here that's putting this mark on people. The right. first beast didn't put the mark on people. Constantine. Constantine didn't put mark on people. It's the second beast that's actually putting the mark on the people. Okay. All right, now read the last verse. I'm kind of scared. <laughs> 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred 
three score and six. Now see, this is why it's important to do our own studies. Praying, of course, you get, of course, all knowledge has to come from our father. Right. Then we start to learn exactly who this guy is that he's talking about here. Who is this second beast? Who okay. is the second guy? Okay. All right. So let's figure it out. Like we said, the first clue is up here where it's talking about how the first beast only had 42 months. Constantine only had 42 months. And when we look to find out where else in the Bible did we hear about this 42 months, we see it over in chapter 11, where in verse 2, it's talking about how they would trample the holy city for 42 months. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 3, we see that this 42 months corresponds with 1,260 days. Right. And we've heard this. A lot of people have put this together, that the 42 months, the 1,260 days, and the three and a half years are all pointing to the same or similar time period. Mm -hmm. So that's what I decided to do. Praise our Father in heaven, hallowed be his name. I decided to look at where we end up when we start off with Constantine in 312 and go ahead 42 months or 1,260 days. Mm -hmm. And what we end up in is the year 1572. Okay. So the second beast, would have started in the year 1572. His reign. He, his reign would have started in 1572. Constantine started in 312. And then 42 months later, we end up in 1572. And who do we find in 1572? Pope Gregory the 13th. Okay. Pope Gregory the 13th started his reign on May the 13th in the year 1572. Mm. Okay. So here is the head of your next B system. And you say, well, what's important about Pope Gregory? Right. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that invented the Gregorian calendar. Mm. Mm. I'm starting to <laughs> wonder now. Hell, he's the <laughs> one who started the Gregorian calendar. <laughs> okay. And of course, we learned in our last class that the mark of our father is adherence to the biblical calendar and his holy days. Well, it was this Pope Gregory the 13th that instituted the Gregorian, Gregorian calendar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing about Pope Gregory, by instituting the calendars, he's the one who put the mark on the people. See, Constantine didn't create a calendar. Right. Before the Gregorian calendar, there was the Julian calendar. Mm -hmm. The Julian calendar goes all the way back to 46 BC. So Constantine didn't have any thing to do with the calendar at all except outlawing the biblical calendar right and making easter a religious holiday mm -hmm. it was pope gregory who created a whole nother calendar system okay so he's the one who actually put the mark on the people but i realized you know that's not going to get us there because everybody's waiting to see this 666 thing right mm-hmm so let's show you how that works. But first, we have to understand that Gregory is an English name. Mm, okay. In Latin, his name was Gregorius. <laughs> Gregorian calendar. And so let's look at how that name actually ends up being 666. Okay. You can see how over here I was working on Constantine trying to see if he was the guy 666. His numbers came close to just like Obama's and Trump's did, but it just didn't add up. But when you look at Pope Gregory, understanding how the Hebrew works, we can figure out what his name is in Hebrew Gematria. Okay. Or real Gematria. Now, first we have to understand that there are no vowels in the Hebrew. Right. So all of these vowel sounds are going to get a zero. Okay? Right? Because that's just the way the Hebrew works. What about the I? We'll come back to the I in a minute because it's not really a vowel sound. It does actually have a number here. Okay. So we'll start with Gregorius first. You have the G, the R, followed by a G and a R. The Gimel is three. The Resh is 200. You see, those four letters gives us 406. Okay. The I would be the Yod. I and Y is actually the same thing. They're just like there's no J in mm -hmm. the Hebrew, there's no I in the Hebrew either. Okay. Both the J and the I are really the Yod. Okay. That's why some names are like Israel and some names are like Joseph. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. 
I, but, I always wondered that, but okay. <laughs> but now we get a 10 there. Then the S, the S sound is this to sets, which gives us a 90. That gives us a total of 506 for Gregorius. Okay. Now all we have is the Pope. Right. And that is two letters? Two letters, P and P, or Pew and Pew, both would give us the 80. So that gives us 666. Mm. So it says that he would cause. So by him bringing in the Gregorian calendar, he caused the people to take the mark. By instituting that calendar, by publicizing that calendar, he's made everybody rich, poor, bond, and free mm. to take on the mark of the beast. <laughs> You're taking on the mark of the beast by following the Gregorian calendar. Wow. He's the guy of 666, and his, his mark he's put on us, put on the world, by making people follow the Gregorian calendar. Wow. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Yeah, and there you go. When you look at his name, Pope Gregorius, that's what you end up with. Okay, now in that clip, we learned what the beast is, who the beasts are today. And we also learned who the man is whose name is 666. Well, in this next clip, we're going to be talking about this mark that he has put on humanity and what exactly it is. If you haven't done so already, make sure you have that like button pushed and your subscription and bell notification button activated. We're starting off with the book of Revelation, chapter 13, which for most of us, this is the first time we've heard about the mark of the beast down there in about verse 17. But let's look back up there at verse 16, which says, and he calls if all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. You already know who it's referring to when it says he causeth. We'll address it a little bit. But like I said, it's well known who that person is. What we really need to pull out of this verse is how the mark is in the right hand and on their forehead. That's our biggest clue other than who he is. The fact that it's in the right hand and or the forehead is going to be our biggest clue as to what the mark of the beast is. The next place I want to bring you to is Revelation chapter 7 and verse 2, which says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Now, this is our first clue as to what the mark of the beast is, except now it's talking about the seal of the living God. You see down in verse three that the servants of God were sealed in their foreheads. Now, like I said, verse two is a clue as to what the seal is. Especially when you look at the New Life version translation of the Bible, it doesn't call it a seal, but calls it the mark of the living God. So what this is telling us is that a seal and a mark is the same thing. So when we put this together, what we can understand is that both the servants of our father and those who serve the beast will have a mark in their foreheads. The World English translation also calls it a mark of the living God. But notice that the Wycliffe Bible calls it a sign. Just as the Dawei Rhymes 1899 translation calls it a sign of the living God. So what we can gather from this is that a mark, a seal, and a sign are all pointing to 
the same thing. So it's easy to understand how the New Testament for everyone reads that the beast made everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves to receive a sign from it. It says that this sign was marked on their right hands and on their foreheads. It's really important for us to understand how these words are used interchangeably so that we can recognize them when they're talked about in the Old Testament. Like back there in Exodus chapter 13, it's also talking about a mark on the forehead. Except here, instead of saying on the forehead, it says between the eyes. Let me just read verse 9. And it says, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand has the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. So here it is talking about a mark being placed on the forehead. But it's talking about the mark of our father. Just like in Revelation chapter 7. It's talking about the seal of the living God. Or the seal of our father in heaven. Hallowed be his name. You look at verse 16, it says, and it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So now it's saying the word token. But when we get over and we look at the interlinear Bible, we see that token is not used. And in its place, we find sign. So in other words, a token is yet another name for the word sign and mark and seal. This is confirmed in second Esdras chapter two, when we see verse 38 says, rise, stand and see the number of those sealed at the feast. Those who have transferred themselves from the shadow of the world and received bright garments from the Lord. What this is telling us is that the sealing process that we read about over in Revelation chapter 7 occurs at the feast. Here are a couple of other translations of verse 38, which is telling us that we receive the seal of the living God during the feasts of the Lord. And under the Emperor Constantine, this government figure made it against the law to follow the biblical calendar altogether. In fact, the Gregorian calendar that we use today was created in 1582 by Pope Gregory just to calculate Easter. That's what that calendar is all about. That's why they got a new calendar in 1582 altogether. That calendar was created so that they could recalibrate the date of Easter. In other words, it is a Easter calendar. Hey, y'all, Coach and Fight here, guys. Stay with me. Shalom. And today we're talking about how Thanksgiving is the mark of the beast. Mm, okay. Now, I brought Stacy in because when I told her that Thanksgiving was the mark of the beast, she expressed a little bit of confusion. <laughs> And being the representative for all of the church ladies around the world. Okay. <laughs> we figured if she's a little bit confused, then there's somebody else that may not understand how these pagan holidays, all of them, are the mark of the beast. Yeah, I can understand um, about Christmas, you know, Halloween, um, Easter. But, you know, Thanksgiving is such a neutral holiday. It's, you know, it's sort of just neutral everybody is giving thanks quote to the father and so i'm very interested in finding out how thanksgiving is the mark and i appreciate you saying expressing how we believe that it was neutral i until this day too thought it was neutral but our father has been working with me 
on something, even in a dream last night, and I knew there was something going on. And when I started praying about it, I was led in this direction to look up to see how neutral Thanksgiving actually is. And it turns out it's not neutral at all. You know, when I would ask um, if it would be okay for us to go up to my grandmother, because we always got the invite to join them for their Thanksgiving dinner. And um, I think a couple of when we first moved back, a couple of times we did, but you would always express that, you know, that's not necessarily something that you wanted to do. And now lately, uh, for the last few years, we haven't been going and um, I just even stopped asking. Yeah. There mm -hmm. was something about Thanksgiving. Something about Thanksgiving. Well, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a little bit of history to show that Thanksgiving is the mark of the beast. All right. So first of all, we're going to look at Thanksgiving in America. Okay. Going all the way back to the pilgrims who first celebrated Thanksgiving here on the United States soil, what we now call the New World. Yeah, that's the story that we got uh, growing up in school about the Indians and the pilgrims. The Indians and, and the pilgrims celebrated it together. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about the pilgrims, we understand that they were coming to the new world because of religious persecution right mm -hmm. in other words they were wanting to continue their faith and in order to do so they felt like they had to come over here on the mayflower in order to do their feast days or their religion the way they wanted to right when we're looking over at this document from wikipedia on thanksgiving we see that the pilgrims first celebrated Thanksgiving in October of 1621. Oh, okay. You're not surprised that it wasn't November? I am. Yeah, that's a big deal. And that's going to be the main point of this class is that they celebrated in October instead of November because that tells us what Thanksgiving was, what it actually is. Okay. We know it was a harvest festival mm -hmm. and we already talked about how these people were coming to the new world so that they could celebrate their feast days when they wanted to mm -hmm. so as it turns out what they were celebrating was tabernacles mm -hmm. the feast of tabernacles so you're saying that they came over here to celebrate their their faith their feast days and turned out that the feast days that they were they were celebrating was tabernacles. Well, that seems like a good thing. It absolutely is a good thing. But before we go on and find out why it changed to November, let's have a quick recap on how the sacred calendar works. Okay. The beginning is when the days and the nights are equal, sometime around March the 20th. Mm -hmm. That's when the sun enters what we know as the fourth gate where it stays there for 30 days. Mm -hmm. The thing about it, you notice that the sun always enters gate three sometime around September the 18th. I see that. In fact, the first new moon after September the 18th will begin the fall season. Okay. That would be the day we know as Yon Teruah or the Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets. But what's important to note here is how it always starts after September the 18th. Mm -hmm. So if we can't have Yon Teruah or the Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets on an earlier date than September the 18th, that means that the earliest, that the first day of the seventh month can fall on September the 18th. You're saying that the first day has to start on September 18th? Or after. Okay. It cannot start earlier. Okay. My point is, is that the Feast of Tabernacles is always 14 days later. Mm -hmm. So even if you have the new moon to fall on September the 18th, mm -hmm. that means the earliest possible date for the Feast of Tabernacles is October the 3rd. Right. So in other words, Tabernacles almost always falls in October. Okay. So the reason why they were celebrating the first Thanksgiving, 
The reason why they was giving thanks in October, they was giving thanks during the harvest festival that we call Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. That's why it was in October. Okay. So in other words, these pilgrims came to the new world so they could celebrate Tabernacles in peace. Okay. So these people coming over on the new world had the mark of our father because they were keeping his feast days mm -hmm. in the proper season. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you look at the Thanksgiving in Canada, they still celebrate it in October. As of today? As of today. Their Thanksgiving celebrations are in October. The thing about it, back in 1789, George Washington changed the feast day known as Tabernacles here in America. He changed it to Thanksgiving by moving the date from October to November. Hmm. Okay. Why did he do that? You want my opinion on why he did it or you want to read <laughs> this document? We know that he changed it and it definitely has to do something probably with the father and him knowing this. Well, like we talked about earlier, keeping the Feast of Tabernacles puts our father's mark on the people. Mm -hmm. But George Washington being a representation of the beast would have wanted our father's mark on the people being the last thing that he needed right. to run a successful government. Mm -hmm. So he would have changed the date in order that the people wouldn't get that mark on them that they would have normally gotten by keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. So he changed it to November. Right. And by doing so, since, like I said, he was a representation of the beast, he took away the mark of our father for Tabernacles and instilled the mark of the beast for Thanksgiving. Then it's really important for us to understand this is that we get the mark of our father by keeping his feast days. And we understand that the beast is the government. All you got to do is read Daniel to understand that the beast system is the government. Mm -hmm. And so by keeping the holidays on the government sanctioned calendar, you have the mark of the beast. Just like by keeping the holidays or the holy days on our father's calendar, you have the mark of our father. By keeping those other ones, you have the mark of the beast. But I'm glad you brought up how you talked about the appointed times because one of our viewers pulled out this verse to me a little bit earlier today. Mm hmm. Over here in Isaiah chapter 14, if you would read verse 13. Okay. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So this is talking about Lucifer, like we see there in verse 12. Mm -hmm. This is Lucifer saying that he's going to ascend into heaven and put his throne above the stars of God. And he's going to sit upon the mount of the congregation. Mm -hmm. But notice this word here where it says mount of the congregation. He's going to set his throne upon the mount of the congregation. Mm hmm. Thing about it, when we come and we look at the interlinear Bible for Isaiah 14 and 13, down there where it says of the congregation, we see Strong's number 4150, which is talking about Moed. Okay. The thing about this word Moed, that's where you hear the word Moedim. Mm -hmm. This is the word used for feast days. Mm. So in other words... When you read this verse replacing Mount of the Congregation with Moedim or Feast Days, what Lucifer was saying that he was going to do was he was going to elevate his throne. He was going to exalt his throne above God by setting it on the Feast Days. In other words, he was going to set his Feast Days on top of our Father's Feast Days or hmm. stamp them out, wow. replace them. Mm hmm. So that's what's actually going on here when you have the president, President Washington, replacing tabernacles with Thanksgiving. Wow. He, he has, in the place of Lucif Lucifer, I can't even pronounce it, he has stamped out our father's Feast of Tabernacles, replacing it with his own Feast of Thanksgiving. I think that's very interesting about how he um, not only says that he will set his throne above the stars, of the most high, but that he will, um, come in and, um, set his throne up 
I guess just wiping out the feast days or having them in such confusion that basically you have wiped them out. Nobody is doing them. You know, you always say that it's comes down to it it's always about this calendar and it's always about feast days it's all about these feast days because that's what gives the mark that's what marks us as his people without keeping the feast days in their proper season we have to do it on the right day we can't just do it anytime we want to by keeping the feast days in the right day it's when we establish ourselves as his people if we do it on a different day or if we don't do it at all we establish ourselves as heathen that's what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. That's why the Messiah went through all of the feast days talking about that it was an acceptable year of the Lord. And, he, and what he did was he taught the disciples the feast days and how to keep them properly, what to do on them, getting doing away with all of the Jewish traditions and showing them exactly what they were supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Hey, y'all, Coach in the Fight here, working on the calendar and came across something really interesting and that I wanted to share with you guys. This is how Pope Gregory, whose name in Hebrew Dramatria equals 666, that same Pope who had a winged dragon for his family crest, the guy who created our modern Gregorian calendar, actually took tabernacles off of it. He actually deleted tabernacles for that year. Let me show you what I mean. We're over here looking at an article on Britannica.com that talks about the modification made to the calendar year 1582. That is the year when the Gregorian calendar went into effect. And what it says here is the most surreal part of implementing the new calendar came in October of 1582 when 10 days were dropped from the calendar to bring in the vernal equinox. It goes on to say that the church had chosen October to avoid skipping any major Christian festivals. And then it says that October 4th, 1582 was directly followed by October 15th. Well, let's look a little closer at those dates. Now, we're over here at a moon calculator where we can punch in the date 1582 particularly September of 1582, and look at when the new moons fell. Now, there was a 0% moon on September the 16th. Of course, that wouldn't have been seen anywhere in the world. And even on September the 17th, it was only 3% illuminated, which means nobody would have seen the new moon that night either. It's only on about September the 18th that they would have saw 1.8% of the moon illuminated, which would have made September the 19th the first day of the seventh month. That would have been the date of Yon Teruah, or the memorial of blowing of trumpets, the first day of the month. But look what day the 15th day falls. The date when tabernacles will occur, it would have started on October the 3rd. And then a week-long celebration, it should have lasted until October the 10th. But when you look at the days that they deleted, they deleted almost the entire week. In other words, there was no October 10th in the year 1582 when Pope Gregory implemented this calendar. So that day, Shemini Estoret, or that great eighth day, was deleted from the calendar altogether for that year. It makes it real odd when it says that the church had chosen October to avoid skipping any major Christian festivals? Well, they skipped probably one of the most important biblical festivals of all time. So the actions of this Pope could explain why the pilgrims left the Church of England fleeing to America in pursuit of religious freedom. We could see this talked about in the article Thanksgiving in America in Wikipedia, how they celebrated the first Thanksgiving in October 1621. This would have been the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why it was a multi-day celebration. It was the biblical harvest celebration of tabernacles that they came to America to celebrate as part of their religious freedom. But that didn't last long because they immediately fell under the persecution 
of the American government, including George Washington, who on October the 3rd, 1789, made a proclamation to change tabernacles into Thanksgiving. Looking back at our moon calculator for 1789, we see that there was a 0% moon on September the 19th, with the first possible sighting of the new moon a day later. That means that George Washington made that proclamation the day before tabernacles began. That means that at almost at the exact time that tabernacles started, George Washington made a proclamation to change the whole festival to the modern day Thanksgiving. But then when we move ahead to 1863, we see that Abraham Lincoln made a similar proclamation on October the 3rd. And going back to our moon calculator for 1863, we see that that date fell in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. But those were only proclamations by presidents. We have to come all the way to 1941 when the U.S. Congress got involved and fixed the date of Thanksgiving to the last Thursday in November. Well, we see that they did that on October the 6th in 1941. Coming back to our moon calculator, we see that there was a 0% moon on the 21st of September. The first possible sighting would have been on the 22nd of September. Two weeks later, the Feast of Tabernacles would have started on October the 6th. In other words, Congress chose the very first day of Tabernacles to change the date to what we know as Thanksgiving. Do you think all of this is a coincidence? Let me know what you think in the comment section. So what do you do if... Like me, you've been celebrating Thanksgiving and these other pagan holidays all of these years. Well, the third testament of the Bible tells us when we find ourselves in this situation to do charitable deeds, other than learning how to live within the law, that's the most important thing we can do towards our salvation is to do charitable acts towards our brother. And make sure you subscribe so you can get more information like this as our Father in Heaven, hallowed be His name, reveals it to us.